Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Bowhunter Chronicles brought to you by Huntworth. For all types of weather, for all types of terrain, all kinds of budgets, it's clothing that just works. Check them out at HuntworthGear.com. Man, we, again, we're we're in November. I have been out after it. Uh, I would say it is officially deer season because I have poison ivy so basically from november until valentine's day i generally have poison ivy so tonight finally got in the game and i've been struggling um seeing deer more observationally than uh when we were in indiana there was some small deer that i could have killed but um tonight had a two and a half year old buck uh 10 yards behind me and then uh worked off and uh just couldn't make the total archery challenge shot. Didn't think it was a good idea to uh, try and shoot through some pines and stuff like that. But uh, at least I felt like I was in the game tonight. Uh, I got bucks showing up on camera um, here. Probably going to get one or two more sits in before I head to Kansas. But uh, really looking forward to it. Really, you know, getting to try out all this gear. You know, we talk a lot about gear and people have new gear coming out. And uh, like that Huntworth Grayling hoodie. I just got one of those. Uh, been using that with their heat boost uh, base layers, and basically that's kind of all I need. Uh, the vest is nice, uh, but we've been having pretty mild temperatures here. I think we've only dipped into like the twenties like one time, and uh, <laughs> surprisingly, that sweatshirt vest combo is pretty slick. So, uh, you know, we've talked about it. And uh, that was one of the things I was, I was saying that I'd like to try and uh, very, very impressed with it. Um, using some more gear, picked up some more stuff from uh, Genesis 3D printing, that tether button. Um, I love that thing. Um, very simple solution, very inexpensive solution to a problem. Uh, maybe that you guys didn't know that you had. Definitely check that out. And those latitude sticks. I mean, uh, I'm using their uh, X-Wing platform. Still not a platform guy, uh, just because I hate setting it up. If anybody has any tips, tricks, anything for setting up platforms, uh, let me know. Uh, but I continually absolutely hate it. So um, just more trouble than it's worth. Um, but uh, but yeah, um, the sticks, the attachment method is freaking amazing. Uh, super easy, super light. Generally, I'm using two sticks with aiders and then one stick without an aider. Um, and then the platform, um, I think I've used four sticks one time this year. So um, really, really enjoying those. So definitely get over, check out our our partners uh latitude you can save 15 percent using code bhc um big shot targets you can save 10 percent using bcp as a code and spartan forge 25 percent off uh using code bow hunter and that's for the entire country uh, they got that lidar they've got that predictive stuff and i've been paying attention from that last podcast where the temperatures are dropping and the brush the pressure is rising like today um and I, man, I had a stud show up on one of my cameras that I chose not to hunt, to hunt today. So we're going to go there tomorrow and, uh, check that out. But yeah, I mean, all of our sponsors, they help us out, help to show out, you know, we've already outlined how much they give back, uh, through the Patreon hunt to our quarterly giveaways. Uh, so definitely check them out. Huntworth, Latitude, Big Shot, Spartan Forge, uh, Genesis 3D, Lucky Buck, and then Zinger and Kanadi. Those guys are great. Um, but one of the things that's been really awesome this year is our Patreon group is just slaying the deer. Uh, so Tyler Manning, he's the one who shot the does up at uh, the deer camp there. He's tagged out. Uh, Robbie Signor, he was also at the Patreon camp. He's one of the three amigos. Uh, he's tagged out. Uh, the guy that's on this podcast, Mark, uh, decoyed another buck uh, in Missouri this uh, past weekend. And, uh, so he's tagged out in Missouri, already killed one here in, in Michigan over the decoy. Um, so that's super cool. And then Wyatt killed a doe, um, down in Illinois. And I'm sure that I'm missing somebody. Oh, Tom Taylor, uh, is out in Kansas. He just killed a nice buck out there and, uh, he's just chilling with the fall podcast guys, uh, boiling skulls. And now he's chasing, uh, does with a longbow. So, um, the community that we built is incredible. If you want to check that out. 
uh, patreon.com forward slash Boner Chronicles podcast. Get in on that Marco Polo group if you're not. Um, pretty cool. Uh, lot to keep up with, uh, but good information, uh, good community, uh, really good group of guys there. So uh, check that out. Uh, but this podcast, you know, going into the rut, you know, I, I don't know. It's hard. Maybe it's maybe it started where you're at, but we just haven't seen the hard chasing and uh, any of that right now. And it seems to be like that's the same thing that they're uh, they're dealing with out in Kansas. I've got uh, a couple of the Montana decoys I just picked up for going out there and uh, going to give some of this decoying a try. So uh, if you're interested in that, you're going to love this podcast. Uh, Mark's been doing it here in Michigan, um, you know, can't use any of these tactics in Michigan, right? Uh, He's been doing it in Michigan and Missouri all over and uh, having success uh, for the last, you know, five, six years. So um, definitely check it out. I know you guys are going to like this one. As always, thank you for listening. Enjoy the podcast. Tell somebody else if they haven't heard of us. And I appreciate every single one. Thanks for listening. All right, everybody. Adam back with another episode of the Bowhunter Chronicles podcast. And this is a time of year where it's so hectic and crazy, like trying to schedule podcasts, trying to get guests, trying to get things that are like relevant, that aren't just like mail it in like, oh, this is, you know, and it's exciting to hear like how, you know, our hunts go and things like that. And then, you know, trying to get people on um, with like pertinent information is tough. And I, to be honest with you, I really hate doing podcasts ahead of time. Um, this one's like going to be like a week ahead of time, which is, which is okay. But by the time, like I'm recording it, putting it out, all that stuff, like I've forgotten like what we talked about or like what were the important points of it. So I, I really do like relish being in the moment of like in the chaos, like like back when we first started, it would be like record a podcast, get done at like two in the morning and then like have to publish it like that day. And I think like where this whole thing was born out of, that's where like, I love being there. So this is, this is kind of different, but so back on here with Mark and, um, we'll, we'll get into it, but a few at this, at this airing date, uh, a few weeks ago, Mark has killed uh, a pretty, pretty good buck, um, great buck from Michigan, uh, compared to the ones he's got in Missouri, probably doesn't hold a candle. He's probably like, Oh, I wouldn't have shot him at all. He needs 12 more years. Um, but, uh, but this, uh, this podcast is, is kind of one. There's a couple of things. One, Mark's been on me about, you need to do a podcast about this. You need to do a podcast on this. And, and, and so we're going to talk some decoy strategies and stuff. And it's relatively again, just like everything else in this podcast, more self-serving for me because I'm going to Kansas and they talk about like all of your, and this is Tom Taylor. I'm going to paraphrase what he said, but he basically said like all of those hokey Midwest tricks that never work in Michigan, um, you know, try them all in Kansas because those bucks will come running, you know, rattling, uh, grunting, decoying, doing all the tarsal drags, all of those things. So this is to kind of uh, get me into that mindset and uh, look really funny here in Michigan. But uh, another thing Mark had been saying is like he listens to some other podcasts, some running podcasts or basket weaving podcasts, snorkeling podcasts. I don't know what it was, but they talk about like the beer that they're drinking or something like that. And Mark is a bourbon guy. If he's a, If you're in the Marco Polo group, you've seen his – you know, LED lights and all the bottles of bourbon. And it's one of the things that he really enjoys. So I told him to get a bottle of bourbon ready, get some bourbon. We'll drink some bourbon today. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. So Mark, how are you doing this fine evening? And how was that, uh, that intro? <laughs> that was a great intro, Adam. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, so yeah, the underwater basket we being podcast that i listen to the guy the guy likes talking about beer and it it's kind of interesting because he introduced it from all over the place but i'm i mean so many beers out there i'm just not i don't follow it that closely but i thought man bourbon you got it's, it's a little narrower field so on your request this is one of my favorite bottles right here smoke wagon straight bourbon whiskey 
They're out of Las Vegas, Nevada. The guy who started it, his name's Aaron. Uh, started in his garage not that many years ago, like six, eight years ago, and now they're big and nationally distributed. And so I only have to drive a couple states away to find it. So there you go. That's what I'm having. How about you? So this one is, uh, I think it's pretty local to us. It's in from Three Oaks, Michigan. It's the uh, Journeyman Distillers uh, Featherbone Bourbon. and That's uh, a good one. I, I really do enjoy this one. Um, it's been going down pretty well the last, uh, few weeks here. Um, now you need to, you need to hold up your glass because that's a gentleman's pour right there. Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> in it for the long haul and I'm serious about that. I, I told you my, my day, uh, you know, I had to work like this whole week, which is like absurd for me. I think I'm on like day eight of nine or something like that. And, uh, you know, for most people, like I, I, you know, I understand like people are like, that's my normal week. But like, I try not to do that. Um, you know, most people say, well, I wish I could do that. Well, like I wish I could too. And that, that, right now, now you are. Yeah. And I, but I have to, <laughs> I, I got to work four days in November. So that's what I'm building up for. So I'm kind of front loading or whatever, just because of the way that everything lines up but question on the bourbon real quick sure. like so some of these bourbons so my brothers are super into bourbon and uh it's like well these ones you can't find anywhere and you gotta go three states away and they're super expensive so what are we looking at in terms of availability and cost this bottle in every state i found it in is 35 dollars and 99 cents uh, it's, I mean, you can get it in Ohio, you can get it in Illinois, you can get it in Iowa, um, obviously Nevada, I'm not sure where else, but there's a lot of states that have it. Uh, it's, and this is, this is probably their, their entry point for this particular brand. And they, they, you know, move on up from there as far as cost. Um, this one's interesting. I, I kind of chase it that this guy here and he designs the label himself. So this is their standard label. And I kind of chase these labels like McDonald's toys, but um, they, every Halloween, 4th of July and Christmas, they put out a, a different label on the same bottle of bourbon. So for those people who like to collect things like me, he got me because I got like 12 bottles of this down there, all with different labels on them, but same juice in the bottle. All right. So, that, that that's what Mark's been been chasing here on this podcast. He's like, you know, you need to do a bourbon intro, and uh, here we oh. are. This is this is where we're at. So, uh, let me know how how you think this uh, this went. If you want this to be a continuing uh, segment on the show, or we can definitely do it when uh, when Mark's around. Maybe it'll earn me uh, an invite to Missouri finally. But uh, anyways, if you want another invite, <laughs> I'll invite you. <laughs> Let's uh, go. You know what? Let's go this weekend. This weekend? Yeah, let's go. We'll so, leave Thursday. So I'm heading to Indiana this weekend ah, to shit. hunt with uh, our good buddy, Eric. So that's the kind of guy Mark is, is he would rather bone our good friend, Eric, out of a hunting experience um, just to make a point. So he can say he invited me and I declined. So anyways. Yeah. Again, decline again. <laughs> yeah. Um, so decoy strategy. So let's talk about how did you get into using decoys? And so Mark's had a lot of success here in Michigan using decoys where, you know, it's one of those things where everyone will tell you, like, A, Michigan's not a big buck state. B, we don't have the deer. We don't have the genetics. We don't have the management, any of this stuff. And, you know, wherever you fall on that, it just kind of falls into the so much hunting pressure. Like I said, those tricks don't work here in Michigan. And, um, you know, Mark hunts. He's got a couple of uh, private pieces that he hunts. But it seems like the one is kind of where it all happens, like, year after year. They're not They're not learning um, from, from the tactics. Um, 
but where did this all start? Like w- w- you watch Lee and Tiffany use a decoy and you're like, you know what? I got to get one of those. No, no, not at all. Um, honestly, the, the property you're referring to, I was sitting there four years ago and it was first weekend, I believe, uh, had a deer come out in the field and it was a, a smaller buck and I'm, I'm back off field on the other side, about 50 yards in. I look across the field with my binoculars and I can see that there's a bachelor group of bucks and uh, the out of the group, the biggest one was a, a 10 point and it was a very respectful Michigan deer and, and the whole group. I mean, there was probably four eight points in that group. Um, and I tried my grunt. I didn't even have my antlers with me. But, you know, when you're 50, 60 yards in the woods on this side, you got a field out there. They're 20, 30 yards in the woods on the other side. How do you get them to, to uh, close that distance? And I, I didn't have a bag of tricks. I mean, I'm literally just sitting there realizing that. I'm just sitting there hoping that this deer comes by, but I tell you what, tomorrow I'm going to be mobile. I'm going to move, I'm going to move over there. And I did, I moved my stand over there the next day. Didn't see the deer again, but that prompted me that that next night I was sitting in the stand and literally ordered this, uh, this decoy from Dick's sporting goods. Uh, so got done, went to Dick's, picked it up the, the day after and hosed it off, tried getting the sun off. And then I just drove it out put it in my spot. That was literally year one of, of decoying for me. And I think it was, I believe it was four years ago now. Um, so yeah, I put it out and just laid it down on its side, threw a couple branches on it and uh, yeah, started using it from there. And that, that year, I think I hunted over it like five days. And, I mean, you, you could probably add some videos to this, like down in the corner or something cool like that. All the different videos I sent you of deer coming up to my decoy, uh, because I found it pretty amazing. Like does would get a little spooky, a little weird. Um, and actually the, this, this year when I shot this buck, I had a couple of does come in the field and they were like right there. And they're like, man, this thing's not moving. It's, uh, it's, it's weird. I don't like it. And they kind of bug out and I've had those blow and take off. And I, I realized that it didn't disrupt things quite as, quite as bad as I thought it was going to. But what, what did end up happening is I would see a buck and they would come up to the decoy. So using some of that, um, using some of that Intel, it's a little, little against what a lot of people online are saying, but I always put the decoy real close to me and i put it parallel to me um so whatever direction i think they're coming from i want them to get a good good visual of it um real real quick yeah. like yeah the world is 360 degrees so everything you put out is parallel to you from some angle so mm-hmm. in terms of the wind or um like line of sight like let, let's let's just talk about it from from like expected uh deer travel and then wind direction. Um, sure. I, if your decoy is clean, so let me start with the decoy. If the decoy is clean, I don't feel like the wind direction matters as much as far as the decoy goes. Um, I say that based on numerous uh, interactions that I've had where a mature buck will come up. Uh, I sent you that video last year. That that buck walked right up and is pawing the ground right at the rear end of my decoy. He got downwind of my decoy, and he's about five feet away from it, and he's just pawing at the ground and pawing at the ground. Um, and I can't say I'm an expert in that, but it, it didn't seem like he really cared. Um, so as far as the decoy goes, I. I'm not really playing the wind as far as decoy location. Now, if I think the the buck that I'm after or I'm hoping that a buck is traveling, you know, with his nose into the wind or quartering into the wind or, you know, whatever uh, you're following there, I put the decoy in a location to where 
I believe that based on how they're traveling, they'll be able to see it. So um, the deer I shot last year, there's... After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by overpriced wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So when I heard that Mint Mobile wireless plans are $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking to them, it all made sense. There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they sell wireless service online. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet savings directly to you. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash waypoint. That's mintmobile.com slash waypoint. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash waypoint. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Field, I'm sitting off the corner of the field a little ways. Um, there's a trail coming up from the south side of the field, and then there's a corner cut trail uh, going from the corner of the field over to the trail coming up to the south side of the field. So my feeling was, uh, based on the wind direction, that the deer were going to be traveling from the east heading west. Uh, what ended up happening is this buck came from the south and that corner cut trail, I'd put the decoy out there so that that deer would have, if, if something did come up that trail, that deer would have line of sight to the decoy. So when I did see a deer coming, put my binoculars up, you know, he has antlers, didn't know exactly what he was. Uh, but when I saw him, I grunted at him to just kind of let him know, Hey, over here. And he looked up, looked, saw my decoy, and I was like, ooh, he saw it. This could be good. And put his head down. And, and the funny thing that I found with these mature bucks, they don't, like an immature buck gets immediately responsive. and They come right up and they're, they're interested. A mature buck is more like um, when I was like in college and a girl at a bar pretending like she doesn't notice you. It's more like that. They'll, he saw it and I knew that he saw it, but he puts his head down and he keeps walking straight forward instead of coming right to the decoy. But his body language immediately changed. He went from a nice, easy gait of walking to he bristled up and whatever you call that, I call it bristling up and they stick all their hair out. And he started stomping instead of just walking. And he goes up and he starts working a scrape and I could hear. I could hear the the dirt hitting the ground, hitting the trees like 20 feet behind him because he was just pawing the ground so hard. Um, yeah, and he ended up coming in. And when I say parallel to me, uh, parallel to me based on what direction I think I'm going to be shooting. Because like you said, it's 360 degrees. So I, from my experience, the buck, you know, that's responding to the decoy will come up and you've probably seen this when, um, when two bucks are getting ready to spar, they don't just walk up head on and, you know, put their antlers together. If you watch their body language ahead of time, they parallel each other and they kind of come in at close distance and do this. And a lot of times they'll come around smell at each other's tail much like a dog does um but that's what i'm finding that that these animals will do when they see my decoy um you know somewhat mature bucks will come in and kind of walk parallel to the decoy but they're also trying to get behind it and i've read i've listened to uh, many things that say that they're they're looking for like a cheap shot. They're going to stick their antlers right in the ass or decoy. Personally, I haven't seen that yet, but very typically they recognize the decoy or they they recognize it as a buck, and they go to the ass end of it. And I I feel like they're probably trying to get downwind, but very typically they will do a couple of like parallel passes prior to going to the ass end of the decoy. So when, when I say I'm, I'm setting it up parallel to me, this is where I'm hoping to shoot. And, and I would love it if a buck would come in broadside right there 
that's how I set it up. Um, I've watched several things where guys will set up a decoy 30 yards out, which is great. Um, but I'd prefer just seeing what I've seen. I'd prefer a 10 yard shot. I mean, the deer that I shot the other day was at like six or seven yards. Uh, my, my range finder only goes to 10 yards minimum. So I couldn't, couldn't range the spot. I tried and it just said, you know, nothing hit three slashes across. Tell me it couldn't range it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, uh, I think probably the most important part that I tell uh, a lot of my buddies that are asking me about using a decoy is I leave it out there on the ground. I don't, I put it in my truck as, as minimally as possible, which I understand is much harder to do on public land. Um, if you're leaving a stand out there, I mean, it, if you can hide it under some branches or whatever, I think that the keeping it scent free is pretty important. Right now, I, I have it at the, the property. It's about a mile down the road, just sitting out there, laying in the field with some branches over it. Um, I feel like that's an important point that, that can't be stressed enough. Uh, the This particular decoy, I mean, I think you've talked about it before. It's huge. It's a, it's a big decoy. It's a pain in the ass to, to pack it up, get it in and out. But in the room that I'm sitting in right now, uh, I have four deer that I've shot over that that decoy. So I feel like, for me anyways, I feel like it, it does make a difference and it's it's worth the pain in the ass. So don't don't get me wrong here that it's it's effective, right? And I want to talk about time of year and things like that. But just because you're talking about the – leave it to Mark to be talking about the size of his decoy, right? But But – you know, you said yourself, it was like a, a, like kind of a impulse purchase, you know, to, to some degree, you know, there was, there was thought provoked, but like, do you think that, or would you consider like trying a different decoy or smaller decoy? Cause I mean, I would like to say like, Oh, well, what, what makes your decoy the best decoy? And you're like, well, I leave it out in the woods and it's the one I have, right? So there's there's a there's a little bit of that. I I honestly like if if it had to be ultra realistic, my decoy wouldn't work. My decoy is not the best decoy. I have no honestly like I love this decoy because it's improved my bow hunting dramatically. I mean, you know, from the time I shot my first buck, Adam was the one that got me into hunting. Everybody's heard that. And that buck's over there on the wall from the time I shot that buck until the next one that I mounted was, I think it was either 18 or 19 years. I shot a lot of little bucks in between, but about 18 or 19 years. And uh, then after that, so I got a a decent one uh, here in Michigan. And then the next year is when I got the decoy uh, because I couldn't couldn't close the distance and there's plenty of bucks in those years in between that, oh man, that, that deer crossed the field over there. I'm going to move my stand over there for the night set or for tomorrow or, you know, whatever. And I did a lot of that. Um, but yeah, it's not, not a brand, brand loyalty thing. I would definitely try a smaller decoy. I actually have a two dimensional decoy in my closet in the other room that I'm planning on bringing down to Missouri with me here in a week and a half. Uh, I honestly don't think that it has to be that precise or that perfect. Um, mine's not, it's just the one that I bought. It was <laughs> honestly, it was the one that was on sale and I could get it that day. So that, that was my impulse there. I wanted, I wanted to close that distance. Um, and yeah, I, I guess going to that, the, the deer I shot this year. It was out there. Uh, I do have the tact cam video, by the way, so I can I can get get with you on that. But um, I was out there, and it was ten minutes before last light. And I can I promise you, I would not have shot that deer if it wasn't for the decoy. Uh, that buck walked out in the field and checked him with my binoculars. I'm like, oh, he's a shooter. Had no idea what he was exactly. Um, and so turn on my camera, turn on my camera, 
tech cam and then my Sony. And then it turned lie. off my camera. Oh God. <laughs> I was, I was having a literal shit fit when I realized that, but regardless. Um, and then I, I grabbed my, my snort wheeze that I just re-engineered and gave him a little toot on the old snort wheeze. And that thing looked up, did the same thing as that other buck I was telling you about. It was like, he knew he was boss because he looked up and he put his head down for a second like he's going to continue feeding. And I saw him bristle up and I'm like, oh, here we go. So I pick up my bow <laughs> and I'm hanging on to my bow. And I didn't even know that I had done this, but I had the tact cam pointed directly at him. Uh, so I, I got a video of him walking all the way up. He came all the way up to within about 10 feet of my decoy. Um, did the same thing that that other really mature buck that uh, I got a video of did and started pawing the ground. Literally, it looks looks like that he's making a scrape. Um, about probably two foot wide by three foot long, dug down deep, like pissed, just throwing dirt. Uh, and I, I had a lot of confidence that he wasn't just going to stand there hat on because my deer – my decoy was parallel to me. So he came the direction I wanted him to decoys parallel to me and got my release on. And I was like, okay, he's good. As soon as he turns broadside, I'm going to draw back. So yep. Turns broadside, draw back, shot him. Like I said, six, seven yards, eight yards, maybe, I don't know, somewhere, somewhere under 10 yards, pretty easy shot. And, uh, he took off on a dead run and went maybe 50 yards and piled up right there in the, in the food plot. So one of the things when you're explaining that to me, um, and especially when you're talking about that deer in particular, um, never really, it never really dawned on me, like the thought process of, of, of one of these deer and, um, and kind of that, you know, I guess maybe it's from, like messing up so many times, maybe it's from like being like, Oh, public land deer do this. And there's this whole thing, like, Oh, they're so, they're so pressured and all these things, um, which, you know, there's a lot to that. But when you say that these deer see the decoy in that particular instance right there, where you say, well, it's like last light or 10 minutes before dark. And, you know, from, from glassing, from observation sits, from probably what you saw prior to using the decoy, you know, it's always those bigger bucks that are the last ones out into the field. Um, and it just kind of made me think like, I wonder, and I mean, you, you probably can't answer this either, but, um, if those deer see that decoy and think, well, there's a, you're in your case, uh, a, a big deer, out in the field already, it must be safe or something, you know, like that they, yeah. they lose that, that sense of, uh, I don't know, like fear or whatever, like, not that it's like comforting, but they're like almost like overcome with rage. You're like, Oh shit, there's another big deer out there. And then that thing kicks in where they're like, wait a minute. Like I'm the big deer here. Well, and I think that I had like, I don't know about you, but when I have other deer around me, one, I don't like the sets of eyes, but two, those are like confidence deer because then I feel exactly what you're saying. When, when the target deer comes in or a deer that you're going to shoot comes in, these other deer that are out there kind of give a confidence. Oh, everything's good. Look at all these eyes looking around. I can go out there and just feed and I, I'm calm. And like typically if there's one deer in a field, I think that a lot of times they're down and then they're up and they're looking and then they're down and they're up and they're looking. But if you have four or five deer, a lot of times three or four of them are feeding and the other couple are looking around. It's almost like they have this unspoken pack that we're going to have a set of eyes up. So I, I do think that it gives the deer uh, confidence having something else in the field. I, I have used the decoy like that um you know down in missouri we we can use minerals so i have lucky bucks 
thoughts and I've put my decoy directly on the lucky buck. And that's when the deer come up, they stop a hundred yards away and they're looking to see if there's something on that lucky buck. I don't think they're looking for me. I think they're looking to see are there other deer in there already. And I will tell you this, um, if you start using a decoy, you'll see a lot of like that night, a uh, week ago or whatever. Now, when I was sitting out there, there was like five doe and a four point. And that four point wouldn't come in less, uh, you know, it wouldn't close 150 yards. Didn't want anything to do with this but big old decoy. And I turn the antlers in and make him look as small as possible. But I mean, it's a, it's a good buck. <laughs> <laughs> for Michigan anyway. So I, I think it's a little bit, probably a little bit big, uh, but every mature buck that I've seen, and I can't think of one that it didn't, didn't happen, but every mature buck that I've seen has come in and checked out that decoy. If it's, if it's really small, they don't seem to come in, but I've had six points come in. I mean, you've seen all those videos of me like, Oh, look how calm they are. Cause something i i honestly i feel pretty confident in having that decoy out there and that's why i lug it all around because i there's been a lot of situations over the years where it's like man that buck you know you grind at a buck walking the other way at 100 yards and they don't give one single shit about you but i i feel if there's a decoy there my strategy works a little better and this is kind of what we talked about uh, few weeks ago when we talked is you know being on public land you have a lot of room to to move around and i have a i guess a benefit of, of having private land but it also the the um negative of being on private is you are kind of hemmed in i mean one of my pieces is 14 acres the other one's 15 acres there's not a lot of room to roam around so if i see something that's 250 yards away most likely it's not on my land. So it, you know, to have something out there that can help close that distance, I, I feel like there's an advantage there to bringing them to you because um, everybody in Michigan's got a grunt call. And I think that, <laughs> I think deer have heard a lot of different fake grunts and they can pick those out pretty easily. <laughs> so one of the interesting things that I want to talk about, like, um, I guess specifically, your successes um maybe in outside of michigan or your experiences outside of michigan versus versus in michigan um but michigan your i want to i want to talk about uh a time frame because your time frame is like not typical great hunting time frame and i you can correct me and say okay well i've used it in the rut too and it works pretty good but you've got like this weird little window that uh, seems to seems to work out pretty well for you. <laughs> well, I'll I'll tell you my time frame with a with a decoy is if I go out in the woods and I'm bringing my bow, I'm bringing my decoy. In the last couple of years, there's there's never been a time where I was like, man, I wish I didn't have that decoy. But there's been a couple of times where it's like, oh, I'm going to Missouri and it's a spot that's a mile and a quarter or so walk i don't feel like bringing the decoy and then i'm kicking myself for not doing it or i have my decoy over there and i'm going over to this other spot and i call the buck in and biggest buck of my life by far and he didn't close that last little bit i think that the decoy would have helped me in that scenario but yeah my my weird little time frame is beginning october when a lot of guys are not not having a lot of success, uh, killing mature animals, but, um, I think that's probably more just shit house luck and the fact that I'm, I'm out there, but also, you know, with specifically relating to the decoy, it, they're responding to it. It's not as aggressive, but they are responding to it. They're, I think they're curious by nature. Um, I mean, I can, you have the, the video of my shot last year and the year before that, I can give you the video of my shot this year. And in all instances, the deer, the buck comes right in and then they parallel and they're, 
they're not, not moving fast. I mean, I really feel like the the decoy didn't make me a better hunter, but it covers up a lot of my sins because the uh, the one I shot two years ago uh, over here at the family farm, he was looking directly my way, but his eyes were focused on the decoy. So I'm up there moving around, draw my ball back and everything. He has no idea. I mean, he was at 12 to 15 yards. No idea I was there. He was so intent on that decoy, and that was October 10th. It's not, we're not in the middle of the rut. They're not rut crazed or anything like that. But um, if, you, if you're looking at your cameras, you will see that the deer, they're starting to spar uh, before our season starts in Michigan. They're, you know, they're not, they're not going at it hard. They're just kind of touching antlers, pushing each other around a little tiny bit. And that's it. Uh, that one that I shot two years ago, let's check this little four point over here, check that little six point or whatever over there, and then walked up to my decoy. But with both of those other bucks, it pushed them around just a little bit. I mean, just kind of touching antlers together. And that was it. Kind of sizing each other up is what I would say. And, and then comes right in and parallels the decoy. And I got a shot on a, a great Michigan buck. Do you think that maybe part of that, like curiosity or whatever, is that they're, because it sounds like they're still kind of like in these little bachelor groups at that time. And they're like, who the hell is that? Like, what's, you know, what's going on? You know, all my buddies are here. He's not supposed to be there or, you know. Oh, I 100% believe that's what it is. I don't, a lot of people talk about a decoy with, um, you know, they're, they're with a hot doe and they're, they're kind of covering off on that doe and they're, they're going to boot this other guy out of the area. And I 100% believe that it's a more of a curiosity thing. Um, they're, when they're pushing these other little bucks around the field, they're not, it's not some big knockdown drag out fight at all. Like I said, they'll just barely touch antlers and usually that, the inferior buck will kind of like prance away and but he stays in the field, but just saying, Hey, you know, it's like a dog rolling over on its back. Okay. I'm, you know, you're, you're the boss I'm, I'm submitting. And it seems like that's what they're doing. And when, when they come over, I mean, the, the one that I sent you the video of last year, I would say that was probably like a, a six year old buck all busted up, just gnarly, heavy, main beams and all the points were broken off except for the one it was like an inch long and just grayer than gray and he came in and when he snorted at it it was like a raspy copd snort like standing right next to a, uh, the decoy and just pawing at the ground five feet behind the decoy and it was it's cool to see i've, I've never heard a, a deer vocalize like that before but I kind of just took that information and worked it in a little bit that it's not a, it's not always a clean snort wheeze when you're doing a snort wheeze. It, you know, I tried working a little, little rasp into my snort wheeze after that. So as you use a decoy later in the season and into the rut, um, does placement change? Does the deer um, response to it change? And like, I guess from that whole like oh a hot doe and uh, a buck trying to push push that other buck out of there or whatever you know we've all been in these situations if you've been in the woods enough at the right time of year um, and I can say like honestly like I've uh, been in the woods maybe maybe five total days in all of my years of hunting where it's just on you know it's those days that you live for where there's bucks running around everywhere and you know, you'll, you'll have a doe run by you and then all of a sudden it's buck and then another buck and then another buck. And then they're, you know, two, you know, two minutes later, they're over there just running around and all grunting and everything. Um, you know, in that situation where you feel like you, there's nothing you can do, right. Where you, you grunt, you whistle, you stop, you yell, Hey, you're like, come on. And then you're sitting up there and there's just these deer everywhere. And you're kind of like, well, what am I going to do now? I mean, maybe that's just me, but. So have you had a decoy out in those types of situations and how do those deer react uh, in that? I would say that I haven't had that as much, but 
kind of like you, you've only, you've only been out there a handful of days. Same thing. I've only been out there all the days I spent hunting. I've only been out there a handful of days where I was like on the X and I'm like, Oh, it, you know, hot doe runs by buck goes by another buck goes by another buck goes by and then the doe comes ripping past this way. And like, I've only had, uh, this, that buck over there when I shot him, there was probably four other shooters in my, my food plot over here in this little tiny quarter acre food plot. And I, all hell was breaking loose. There were so many deer running around. It, it was absurd. Um, but I, I just, I haven't had that much experience with the decoy to really be able to speak to it. I will say that I've had it um, where the decoy is out there. I know that there's a hot doe in the area and a buck came through, nose to the ground, searching for this hot decoy, or I'm sorry, hot doe. And he just goes blazing through. And I'm like, well, that was interesting. I don't think that. I don't think he even saw the decoy or noticed it or anything. So I grunted at him. He turns, looks at the decoy, comes flying back right up to the decoy, stops, does about a circle around it, and then just goes back the, the direction he was originally heading. And it was like, not like a full circle because I had it tucked right up against trees, but it was kind of like it did like almost like it parallel at once. And it's like, nope, I don't care. I'm out of here and continued on its path and it it went all the way around this field that i was sitting on was like 150 acres all the way down this tree line all the way up the other edge all the way i mean it, this deer was traveling i you know that was that was one that makes you understand why bucks get so skinny during the rut um but they they'll come in check it i would almost say the early season you know that that chase phase or the the pre the pre rut activity is where I've had my success, but I've also been in some fortunate situations where I haven't been hunting as much during the rut because I have my tags filled, so I'm sitting on my couch watching lions and drinking bourbon. So, <laughs> so in that scenario, and that's what I wanted to ask: like when you're using the decoy and you're saying you're bringing it, you know, pretty much every time that you go. Mm-hmm. Um, are in in that instance it doesn't sound exactly um like the other scenarios are you setting this up on the like the field edge or like what has your experience been like in the timber you know because it still needs to be visual all that sort of stuff so i'm i'm getting it out there where i think that they can see it the best um you know and, and that's one of the things about hunting or decoys i think that it's like it's like my long range track that, you know, same thing I say about my rattling antlers, like a grunt call. I think they're only going to hear so far you're rattling to them. And, and that buck that I rattled in last year was 150, 180 yards. I mean, it was way down there going the opposite direction. That's one where I'm really kicking myself for not having a decoy out. Um, Cause I would have put that in the timber pretty much right underneath me just so that they could see it from the field and from the timber. Um, but you know, when, when I'm setting up in a spot, you know, with more timber, I still want it. you know, if you're walking along where I happen to have it on the family farm, it happens to be in a spot where if you're walking along, all the trees line up and I'm like, Oh, if I was sitting there with a shotgun, I'd have like an 80 or 90 yard shot. Well, it's just a visual zone for the decoy. I just want them to be able to, to see it from as far away as they possibly can. Uh, the buck I'm referring to from last year, when I rattled at him, he turned around and came in and he closed the distance all the way to like 20 yards. I think it might've actually been like 17 yards, but still he was behind some shit that I couldn't shoot through. And I feel like if I would have had the decoy there, he would have closed the distance all the way, but he stopped right there on the edge of this ditch and looking around and whatever was making the rattling sound, he couldn't see it. And he started getting spooky and looked like he was going to bail. So, um, kicking myself for not having the decoy on that day, but I was being lazy cause it was way back in, in the woods over at a different farm and I just didn't bring it with me. So, so I've actually thought about getting an extra decoy 
just so that I have one that I can be more mobile with because <laughs> it is a pain in the ass hauling these things all over the place. Well, I'm really interested. I've been looking at those like Montana two dimensional decoys. Um, the guy from ARD, Tim Zelinka, um, he was just telling me, you know, that I need to get one for Kansas and he killed his buck last year over one and he's got video of it. And, you know, it's, it's strange cause it's sitting there, you know, kind of even like blowing around, but there's deer all around it and, you know, coming in and the buck he killed was, I mean, I held the antlers. That's fr- like, it's a freak. Like, I think it was, I don't know. I want to say it was like 160 or something like that. But it was all mass. The thing must have weighed twenty pounds. Like it's it nuts. And it just walked right up to this flat piece of tent material, you know. And um, so I've I've considered it for for going out to Kansas. Now, um, you know, last we left off with you, you were hunting these mega giants in Missouri, and uh, you went down there. You, you just hunted down there the one time this year so far, one trip. Yeah, we, yeah, we went down there for two days for the Saturday Sunday. And so, how did that go? What did you learn? What uh, what's going on down there? And I haven't got any more pictures from you on that, so I, I'm not sure keeping everything close to the vest. Oh, I can I can send you the pictures. Those deer are still there, but um, so when I went down there, the the, the whole plan was like a 23 year old's plan. So I was flying from Seattle to Chicago, getting Chicago at midnight. My buddy was picking me up in my truck and we're driving to Missouri. So I say it was a 23 year old's plan because I didn't map it from Chicago to Missouri. I'm, I'm like, well, you know, if you got to drive from here to Chicago, that's like, you know, three and a half hours. So it's probably gonna be like three hours to Missouri. Now it's like, five hours and 15 minutes to Missouri. So he picked me up. Um, actually when I left Seattle, I'm like, I'm going to get some sleep on the plane. So I'm going to drink some bourbon and I was in comfort plus. So they just kept bringing me bourbon. So by the time I got to Chicago, I was a bag of dicks, never slept <laughs> through my stuff. And we, we, uh, I think we're on the road by like 1230, drove our five hours to Missouri, got one speeding ticket. And uh, got to Missouri, unloaded a little bit of stuff. We both showered separately and uh, went out and went hunting. And it was horrible. I felt so, <laughs> I felt so off. I was feeling my age that day. The, uh, the part that I didn't realize is when I was in Seattle at this uh, big conference, I, I ended up getting COVID again. So, um, so I wasn't exactly feeling myself. And I was telling uh, Andrew all weekend, man, man, I just feel weird. I don't know what's going on. I just feel weird. And yeah, I got back home and realized I had COVID. So I was pretty sick that whole week, but we ended up hunting, I guess it was Friday, Saturday, and then, uh, Sunday morning went for the hunt. And I'm like, our plan was to hunt Sunday night and then drive the full like seven and a half hours back Sunday night after the night hunt. I'm like, there's, there's no way I can do that. You know? So we, uh, during that hunt, we weren't seeing a lot. It was mid nineties. I mean, it was hot. Um, saw a lot of chiggers, got a lot of chigger bites everywhere. Uh, and it was a little bit of a chess match because we're out there. All the crops are up. The deer are definitely in the crops. And, uh, the one spot that that's way back in there. Um, but I was hunting. I decided that I wasn't going to hunt that Sunday morning. Uh, I was going to hunt a spot that's easier to get to because I was just, I was just worn out. And so sitting over in this other spot and one of our target bucks that we got named is on camera and everything was in front of the camera, uh, at the, at that farm for like 45 minutes, he'd leave and they'd come back. He's just in front of the camera and then he'd leave again and he'd come back and he's hanging out in front of the camera. I'm like, that would have been. That would have been fun. I mean, it would have been cool to shoot him. It was uh, it's a great buck. I mean, it's probably 145, 150, um, just all of it. You know, it's got it's got all the stuff. It's got long main beams, tall points, uh, quite a bit of mass. Um, had a 
about a five inch kicker coming off the bottom of its uh, right beam that it's since lost, uh, but it was coming right out over its eye. And I guess I I wanted to call it a drop tie, and I think it's more of a kicker, but it looked pretty cool. But it's since lost that, so that that's a bummer, but still a nice buck. Yeah, so you definitely can't shoot them this year because, you know. Oh, yeah, next year that's going to be so much better. Yeah, this <laughs> this year, you know, we don't shoot anything with broken tines. We don't shoot, you know, we don't shoot up and comers. Like, no way. No I way. Don't. I think you forgot who you're talking to, buddy. I got uh, that that buck over your left shoulder. You realize you're talking to the guy that has a whole pile of those in the garage. That you know, of all the deer, I was it, I was I was thinking about this as we were talking. I was like, the two on either side are private land, and that one's public land, Michigan. And yeah. it, it, I think that kind of like sums up my my hunting career. Uh, but the deer over my left shoulder there. That's the one that I, I messed up on a really nice one um, the morning. And then both my brothers killed deer. And uh, we in 30 years of hunting, we never killed deer on the same day. And you know, uh, even with rifles, um, the level of commitment uh, that my brother Drew has to bow hunting um, is... Uh, is it more or less than rifle? Uh, it's... It's less than a rifle, um, but his rifle hunting is more to get out of work than it is to kill a deer or uh, even sit in a stand. So the fact that he went out that morning and killed a deer, and then Dustin was in South Dakota, killed a big mule deer, and then I missed. I'm like, I'm the one that screwed it up. And so that's the the buck that came in, and I wasn't going to miss again. I wasn't, I wasn't missing out on that, uh, memory. And, you know, the thing is, is like, you know, Frank's over there with the, with the four wheeler. He's like, I'm not going in there. You know, I'm where you, where I shot that deer and Drew's like coming with me. And again, he does not have the, the, I, I don't know, like the drive to like go in, you know, my brother, Dustin, he'll go in and waiters and you know, take his boat in and do, do all the things. My brother Drew's like, yeah, that's cool for you guys. Um, I'll, I'll be back at the camp with the bourbon. Uh, <laughs> well, and, and we just, we just kind of did something that, that I actually hate. And it seems to be such a, a part of our hunting culture. But when, you know, I see it all the time on Facebook because I'm on all these different groups like you are, and somebody will shoot one and immediately, like their very first post, hey, I shot this deer. It's not the biggest. It's no trophy. It, all that shit. I hate that shit. Like, I, I wish, I don't know how to cure it because, I mean, I hate it and we're still doing it. Like, like I have deer sitting behind me that are not world records. I have a bunch of deer on the wall and and it's kind of like every bike race I've ever been into. I'm, I'm not going to win every bike race. I'm not going to, probably not going to place in most of them. None of these deer are world record deer, but you're not going to be the person who gets first place. And and that's the that's the thing that we as a kind of a hunting society, I think we need to change. We need to stop shitting on the deer that we're shooting. Like this is an awesome, awesome sport. I love it and I'm guilty of it just as much as everybody else because I consider a deer nice or not nice. But for myself, like I I changed a few years ago because I realized that I was shooting a lot of deer and cutting antlers off and throwing them in a box. And there's a lot that we need to do on on uh, especially Michigan land where there's a lot of doe. I mean, our herd is way, way out of balance here. So I feel like if I'm not going to mount it on the wall, I'm going to shoot a doe instead. And and that's just my personal philosophy. Not shitting on anybody else's deer, but if I'm not going to mount it on the wall, I'm going to shoot a doe. And that's just what I've been doing for like five years now. Well, and that's the thing about that deer in particular is that one probably means more to me than like yeah. a lot of the deer that I, I've killed. I mean, I got, I got a whole bench full of them over there. And it's funny because like, you know, world's worst bow hunter. Right. And then it's like, 
oh shit, there's a box of antlers over there. And like, oh yeah, I forgot about those. Ones. You know, like, you know how it goes. You shoot them and you're like, oh yeah. But in, in the moment, like you can't take that away. Like, I think, I don't think it's the, I don't think it's the sentiment. I don't think it's the like shitting on the deer. And like I said, like that, th- that little six point, um, probably means more to me than uh, a lot of the deer that I've killed uh, a lot of the big ones. Um, because like I said, like in 30 years, like my brothers and I, even with rifles have never killed three yearling does on the same day, maybe not even the same trip. I mean, we could have, you know, a couple of years ago, except for I missed with a rifle twice, twice. I killed the elk at yeah. like 300 yards with somebody else's rifle missed with mine in bow range and then missed again. Um, and it's just, it's just the way that it goes. So to, to be able to kill three deer on the same day, I mean, that's super cool. And like to get oh, yeah, that's like, awesome. redemption on that. But, but I think like, again, I, I say it with like, uh, however you want to get into like, uh, politics and worldview and like people, uh, feeling other people's feelings for them. Um, we live in a society today where um, news and everything spread so quickly. Our availability to information is, and, the, and then for algorithms and AI to keep putting the same things in front of us, because we saw that everybody thinks that, that, that hundred to 140 inch deer is like the standard. It's like, that's what you need to do. And so many guys, especially that are starting out and uh, you would be one of them. I think, um, you know, you, you come in like to like get serious about hunting or like to be like, okay, I want to do archery now. And it's later in life. And it's like, well, I'm supposed to be killing these bucks, but I don't know what I'm doing. And I don't know, You know, and I'm talking about like when you first bought your first bow and you were shooting arrows seven feet over the target. And we were like, those arrows are still behind Frank's house somewhere because we never found them. You know, I don't even want to know how many (laughs) arrows there are buried. in Somebody's going to like do something in Grand Haven and they're going to find like a hundred aluminum arrows in that backyard. (laughs) So, but that's the thing is like you get into it and and fast forward now where you know, you pull up Instagram and you're like, Oh, I like this company. I like this company. Well, they're all killing these, you know, these great bucks, monsters, whatever. And it's just, that's the standard. And you're like, well, this is the, all those guys killed little bucks. They didn't just start killing big bucks, you know? Oh, a hundred percent. And that's like talking to my buddy, Andrew, that that's going to, uh, Missouri with me because I like them a lot better and, than Adam. And congrats to Adam. you know I was thinking about that, but anyways, um, <laughs> congrats to Andrew on his first buck. Now uh, he's right? a Patreon member. Yep. Oh yeah, first buck, and, and that's what I was. You know, I I wanted to make sure that it was clear with him because he was hunting my land. You know, just down the road here, and I felt like he was like adopting my standards. Or even when we go to Missouri, I felt like he was adopting it and and i don't know if he was or not but i wanted to make sure i was clear with him like you know frank said it years ago you got to get one under your belt and that's resonated with me for so long because i'm doing a specific thing for me with all the days that i hunt all the things that i'm doing and it's probably more than a lot of guys like andrew's in a situation where he's his wife's super understanding about him hunting and everything. She's actually really excited for him for hunting and all that stuff, but he's also newly married. It's a different situation when you're in your first couple of years of marriage. You know, there's a different situation when you have a baby at home, there's a new job, all that stuff plays in your situation and your amount of hunting days. And that I feel like really pertains to, you know, not that you couldn't, go out and put out a decoy and have a great buck walk in, but, you know, kind of like a realization of how many days you're actually going to hunt and all those days, uh, you know, subtracting out all your days without any opportunity at all. Like you didn't see any deer. 
So what does that leave you with? Because you're going to come out, you know, you got kind of like this gross and then you got a net and then your net net is like, what are your real opportunities? Like how many deer are you going to have within 25, 30 yards? That's a small number. Um, for me, I, for me, I, I'm going for a specific thing and you're always pressing me on like, well, what exactly is that thing? I'm like, number one, it's something I feel really good about. I have a great story and, you know, like something that I'm, I'm passionate about and I might not know it until it walks in front of me. You know, you might go, well, you know, Mark, why'd you, why'd you shoot that deer? That's 140 inches. And there's that giant that all these guys I showed the picture to, you know, they said, I'd, I'd quit work and go hunt that deer. Well, yeah, that deer's out there somewhere, maybe. Um, but to me, it's like, what, you know, what is the thing that, that really does it for me? Like, uh, you know, what is the, what's going to make the story? What's going to make the adventure for me? What's going to make me seek to keep coming back and, and keep doing it over and over again? Cause it's, it's just something that, that I enjoy. Uh, but I don't, I don't necessarily want to, like when my son was hunting, you know, he's 16 now. And of course he's got a car and all that stuff. He's not as into it, but his first deer, he was like, well, dad, that's only like, I think it was a four point. Dad, that's like a, uh, a four point. Or maybe it was a spike. And I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, I thought we were shooting eight points. Like, dude, you're seven years old. <laughs> Just shoot the deer. Like, like if you like that deer, if that deer gets you excited, he was so excited. And I was like, man, I got a hunting buddy for life. I'm hoping he comes back to it. But, and he shot a handful of bucks and, and as biggest as an eight point, we got it mounted. That's, you know, it's great for him and he loves it. Doesn't hunt anymore. Hoping one day he comes back to it. Andrew, I'm so excited for him. And he shot that four point over there. And that was as thrilling for me to be a part of that as it was to to shoot the 10 point that I shot. It was just cool experience and positive experience for him and, and for both of us really. And and so that's that's what I encourage people to do when they're out there hunting. Like that's what's going to build our sport. Yeah, I know. And it, it, I, I feel like I'm in like in a, I'm in a weird place and I go to my, my buddy, Josh, you know, he, uh, he, he's tagged out this year and when, you know, he's really big into, uh, he's really big into fishing, you know? So he's like, well, you know, it's steelhead time and all this stuff. And it's like, I know, but he, he just put his boy on a deer and his boy just killed a deer. And do I know Josh? Uh, probably you've met him. Okay. I won't put him on blast on here, but, uh, okay. but, uh, but yeah, so he's tagged out. He, he loves, uh, steelhead fishing and, and all this stuff. But I mean, we talk about it, especially like for turkey season, it's like one and done. Right. Like, so as soon as you're, as soon as you kill that turkey, it's over. So I would rather mess up on a hundred turkeys with a bow and continue to get out there and hunt. And, and we've talked about that from a, from a deer hunting perspective too, is like, you know, right now I feel like we're getting into like the best time of year. And like, this is a, this has been a weird year for me because I, I hunted the Patreon hunt and had a ball and I've been out two other times, seen deer. Actually, so yeah, I hit a doe, um, and di didn't recover it. It was, uh, brought a dog out there. Like I hit it back. Like the deer's dead. I just don't know. Like, I don't know what happened. Like it, the blood just, just stopped. And the, we, we like, we're limited on permission. I shot it behind Frank's house, like where we could go and everything and brought a dog in there. And the dog really didn't progress the track and just, just a bad deal. Uh, but it kind of goes to like what I've said before. And especially, and I mean, it kind of even goes into like what we were talking about with, uh, with Andrew there and like new hunters and in, in general, it's like, I feel like every year, like the first couple deer that I see, like. I get the yips, like no matter what, like, it's like, I, there's, there's sometimes like last year where I was like, I think I'd been out enough and like had enough deer in front of me already where I was like, okay, I'm, I'm comfortable. But these were the first deer that like I had a opportunity to kill. And it, and the difference was like, I hunted the whole Patreon hunt with my longbow and I really yeah. thought I was going to get it done. Like I had, I had a doe like completely oblivious to, 
that I was there like at like six yards. Like she just came up out of this grass, but it was like on my weak side, I got a 60 inch bow. So I'm not going over the bridge like easily. And yeah. then she came out and she was like, she's probably 15 yards out. And I had like a, maybe like a football size, like window between these two trees to make a quartering away shot. And I was like, you know, if she goes two steps, you know, over this way, then she's right. She did exactly what I was hoping for. Right. And then she just fed directly away from me like they always do. But if that was a, you know, the, the 30 pointer, right. If that was a 130 inch buck or something like that, like I'd be losing my freaking mind. And yeah. I, I feel like, you know, being out with the compound, I was like, okay, well, here's these deer draw back. Like I, I, I got it on video. Like I, I probably should have shot her like when I first drew back, but like, cause watching the video, like it seems like an eternity, but like in my mind, it happened so quickly, like in the, in oh, the yeah. moment it happened so fast. And, you know, so I'm at full draw, like looking at this deer and like, I don't know, she got behind some stuff. So I shot it like a weird angle. It was just a bad deal. But all that to say, like, generally speaking, I feel like that's what, that's what happens, right? Is that, that first deer, at least for me, like I lose my freaking mind and I'm like, Oh, I got to do it. Like, it's too pressing. And like, if you don't get a proverbial few under your belt, like it doesn't, it, you know, those deer get close and you look, lose your damn mind, you know? I, I'm telling you, man, that that's like, a, like, and I'll say to, to some extent, I've kind of lost that. Like when I shot that, that buck last week, I was pretty cool. I was good. I wasn't, I wasn't shaking at all, but I tell you what, last year <laughs> in December, I'm down in Missouri. It's like, we're in our final hunt. Like literally all of our stuff was packed. We're going to get done hunting. We were driving back to Michigan and I'm, I'm sitting down there, freeze my ass off. I got my decoy out. Um, I'm back in the woods a ways. Uh, I think that the deer are going to come from over here on this ridge. I see a buck walk out and he's 200 yards away. Um, not a chance he can see my decoy because my decoy is back here, like in an opening in the woods. It's looking, I guess it was east. Um, so I rattled him in and he comes down and he saw my decoy. And I don't know what, I mean, it was, an, it was a great buck, great buck, probably mid 150s. Awesome buck. I was so shook. I I couldn't do anything. I don't think I could have spelled my name at that point. I mean, I was so shook. And that was like, that was a really cool hunt for me because I kind of felt like I had, to some extent, like, like hunting had kind of become a little bit of an assembly line type of thing. Like your repetition, 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 you're out there. I mean, that was, I think, my... Um, the end of the second full week that I'd spent in Missouri. And it was just a lot of repetition, a lot of hours in the stand. And for whatever reason on that last hunt, I was just shaking like a leaf. And I, I mean, I'll tell you, I shot 10 feet over this deer. My, my hands were numb and everything, but I don't know what it was, but I like drew back. And as soon as I get back, my, I, I hit the release and I mean, I, I'm not even, I don't have my pin on the deer. I'm not looking through my peep. I'm like coming down on it. And I like, shoot. <laughs> like, I, what an idiot. But it was like, like I enjoyed telling that story because it, it just brought back all of um, what I really love about hunting. And that's the, the excitement of the chase. Like the, you know, not just going out there and like, killing something to put on Instagram or send a pic to your buddies or whatever, but just that excitement of the chase and kind of the camaraderie of being able to share it with you and share it with Andrew. And, you know, I always show, I always send your brother's pictures and, and stuff like that, you know, especially like one thing I love about the decoys, you get a lot of deer in there really close. And so I send snaps to everybody of the decoy and videos of these, these deer coming up to the decoy and it, 
to me, that's just like a, a really kind of cool additional thing that you see because it, it you see a little bit more of, um, I always call it deer acting like deer when they're out there and they're sparring or they're breeding or, you know, you hear weird vocalizations you don't normally hear. I feel like that's deer acting like deer when they don't know that you're there and you're kind of fooling them. That's uh, that's a part of the chess game that I really enjoy. Yeah, that's one of the things I wonder if like wouldn't help me, um, because like I said, like I I feel like and like uh, I we talked about it on here for sure is that like that first deer of the year that you're going to shoot or like whatever it's everything seems to go sideways and you know there's guys that talk about like drawing back on every deer that they see that's in range just to get those repetitions. Yeah. And when you were talking about that December hunt, it made me think of like, it was like Christmas Eve or like between Christmas and New Year's, I hunted one of Mark's properties and uh, he's like, well, don't shoot any small bucks, but you know, you can shoot a doe over there and it's, it's narrow. And uh, these bucks came in and I got some really cool video and my bow was hanging there and I got my bows, a carbon bow that, carbon's eye on and uh i think it was the icon at that time but uh anyway then this line of does comes through and i'm like oh i'm gonna smoke one and it was like five or six does so the first couple go through and i'm like all right i'm gonna shoot the last one so i grab my bow and i grab the release and so carbon bow is like picking up a like a warm nice you know, insulated, whatever, grab my release. And it's like holding on to an ice cube and I draw back and I'm waiting for these deer. And it's like one deer goes by two deer goes by. And I'm like, my freaking hand is like frozen solid. And I've been like the kid in the Christmas story. (laughs) that stuck his tongue to the flagpole. Yeah. My, my, my hand is like frozen to this release. And then here comes these deer and I'm like shaking, I'm freezing. You know, and I got this deer there and it's like, I think it was like 30 yards away. And it, I mean, they all did the same thing. So I knew like, I knew the range, I knew everything. Like I was like locked up solid and I was like, this deer is going to continue running that same way. And it's going to end up on these people's driveway. And I'm like, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to have to let down. Like, this is a bad, if it would have been a buck or something, like maybe I would have changed my thing, but I'm like, this is not, it's the last deer. So like it was like a two sets of like does and fawns or like, you know, whatever. So it's not a very big deer. It was just like, this is the one I'm going to shoot because it's the last one. And I was like, I'm not doing like a international incident with the neighbors with on this. So, but I, but to that point was like the confidence of like those deer never saw me. They never yeah. did anything. I got drawn back. I let down, they continued about their day. And I just wonder you know, the guys that say that if there isn't like something really to that and like, maybe that can help somebody like when you're like, okay, well, I don't want to, you know, this isn't a deer that I'm going to shoot, but like to just go through those motions. But I, but I think like there's enough like uncle Frank instilled in me that I think if I got drawn back, like that deer I passed on in uh, Ohio last year, the one I had on video, if I'd have got to full draw on that deer in that moment when I was videoing him and I like got anchored and I put the pin on him, like, I don't know that I would have been able to let down. I think I would have just let the arrow go. So I think there's like, there's you, you, I think mentally strong, like you have to like really know you're not going to kill that deer. Cause I love killing deer. Like that's oh. just something that like, I really enjoy. And I, it doesn't matter like really what it is. Um, and, and that's something that I'm struggling with. Not, not necessarily with Kansas because like, I know that there's big deer in Kansas and I, I've been watching some videos to look at like antler size and body size and stuff like that. But like this trip to Indiana is going to be like one where it's going to be difficult not to shoot like just the first hundred inch buck that comes in. Like if I shoot, if, if like literally if a hundred inch buck comes in, I'll probably shoot it. Um, just because I've never I mean, I was telling some guy at work today, I'm like, I've never even been to, I've never hunted Indiana. I've never even set foot on this property. So like, I, I don't, you got, I don't know that I'm. state land down oh, there? Yeah. Or what are you doing? Oh yeah. Okay. Like, no, Mark, we don't, 
we don't hang out at the pizza huts. Like we don't know these, I, you know, you, don't, you, yeah. you know how many people who have like been like Googling pizza huts in Missouri <laughs> that have told me like, well, I'm going to find this like Casey's in pizza hut. <laughs> Go find it. I mean, more power to you. That's all part of the hunt. That was my buddy, Kurt. <laughs> He'll tell you it's the best thing I ever did in my life. He's, he's told me that several times, Mark, that's the best thing you've ever done. <laughs> and those people are, I mean, those people I ran into in the pizza hut, they were gold. I have no idea how I ended up running into these people. And this many years later, I'm still invited back and they got a house for me. And I mean, the wife just texted me the other day and she's like, when you coming down again? I'm like, ah, oh, you know, uh, what am I going down the second? And I'm like, hey, I'm coming down on the second. She's like, all right, your house will be ready for you. I got a house. Like, it's so, I mean, they're so cool. And I have no idea why. I mean, you've known me most of my life. I'm not that great. <laughs> I have no idea why these people like me. <laughs> so uh, I guess uh, we can, we can kind of wrap this up, uh, finish up with the, with the decoy. Like, so if you were to, to tell somebody about decoying deer today, and like, I'm sure because of, I know you, like we said, uh, you've looked at all the decoys out there and you've, you've, you've been online and you're like, okay, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. Is there something better that I need or like whatever? Uh, if you were going to tell somebody to buy a decoy, like how would you go about buying one or like, what would you, what would you recommend? Um, and then, uh, if anybody wants to follow along with your, your journey, like you just changed all of your stuff. So I'm like, I was like, who the fuck is this guy? And, uh, uh yeah. So anyway, like what, what would you look for in a decoy? Um, so I bought the one that with the name I can't pronounce, but I think it's like flam blue. It's the, the, uh, fishing tackle brand from when I was a little kid. Uh, they made all the tackle boxes, but that's, that's what I bought. I, you know, I've, I've looked at a ton of them. I literally bought the one that I could have the next day. Uh, that, that, that was my, um, uh, reason for buying that one. And honestly, it's worked well. I, I beat the hell out of it. I throw it in my truck. I I've dumped it off my truck. I've done all kinds of stuff. And, um, there's a couple of things that I would, if I were to, helping flam blue with their design there's a couple things i would change to make it a little more sturdy but you know if shit doesn't break you don't buy new ones so maybe it's by design um if you do buy it it's almost like the guy at dicks told me it was impossible to put it all back in the, the body so i figured out the method if you have a problem with that method i'll teach you it'll cost you like one bush light and i'll teach you how to do it um but yeah, I don't, I mean, I've looked at the really expensive ones. I don't knock uh, shit on any brands. I'm sure they're great. I think, you know, the one that I got was $150, but it was $120 on sale. So that's that's what I bought. Um, I think pretty much anything that gives you that look will do it. Um, I haven't, I can't say that anything about the one that I bought is necessarily special other than it looks convincingly enough like a buck that, that they come up to it. And I can tell from a hundred yards away, it's a hunk of plastic. So they're not real discerning in that way. Um, I'm going to try a, a two dimensional decoy this year. I'm bringing that down with me just so I have something a little more portable, a little more, more mobile. Um, my, I guess my points are, I put it outside as soon as I get it and I leave it outside for the season. Even when I bring it home, it, it sits over here on the property line where my dogs can't get to it because I don't want sand on it. Um, I put it parallel to me because every deer that I've ever seen that was interested in the decoy parallels the decoy. Um, I put it closer than most uh, articles and most videos say that you should put it usually within like uh, two to five yards of the base of the tree that I'm in. Um, I would love to try it someday moving with a decoy, like stalking with a decoy. I really feel like based on what I've seen, that would work, but I haven't been in a, a scenario where I could try to make that happen. But 
especially during the rut. I feel like closing distance with it would probably work. Um, a lot of guys ask me, do you put scent on your decoy? There's a little scent wick hanger on there. Uh, I, I don't put any scent on my decoy. I have tried putting a scent wick like on a bush nearby or on the ground. Haven't noticed a significant difference enough to say, do this or do that. Or, you know, I think this worked. Um, I think it's more the visual of the decoy itself. So I just don't put scent on it because I don't want it to, if they don't like it, I don't want my decoy to smell like that. So, um, yeah, those are kind of the mainstays of my points about a decoy. And I try to do something that I think would be realistic. Um, a lot of bucks, especially in Michigan, we're a really high pressure state. A lot of guys are out there with a grunt tube. I don't typically grunt. Uh, sometimes I will, like if I have a situation where my grunt calls right there, whatever, I want to get deer's attention. I'll grunt at it. The, the one that I grunted at two years ago that was on that corner cut trail, uh, I grunted at that deer and he looked at my decoy and, and it all came together. So I don't think that's a bad situation, but I, it's not my typical. Uh, I find the snort wheeze is super effective I, I think it's an aggressive challenging type of call so um i feel like if you have a mature buck it's gonna come um the other points about it to remember are scares a lot of does that are hanging out in the field i haven't noticed that that's to my detriment so i'm not really worried about that but if you put your decoy out and that scares does and you're like, oh shit, I don't like this. Uh, maybe try it again, but I mean, it's up to you. I'm not trying to push a decoy on anybody. And also little bucks, if you're looking for a four point, it, a four point typically doesn't want a challenge. It's not going to come up and be curious of an eight point decoy. Um, they don't seem to be scared of them. They don't seem to take off, but they keep their eye on it and they keep their distance. They're out there in the satellite just just like a satellite bull and an elk herd, they, they keep their distance from the herd bull. Um, I think those are probably my bullet points. And then if people want to follow along, like if they got questions for you or like, how can they, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Um, so on Facebook, it's Mark Slegel. I look like this. Uh, on Instagram, it's on the hunt, but it's like a weird to get to on the hunt. It was like underscore period on the hunt period underscore um so if you look at any of the bow hunter chronicle stuff i'm i'm a tag down a lot of that stuff so you can click there and click through to me if you want to see it and and if anybody wants to talk to me on snapchat that's what i'm hunting i love snapchat for hunting my buddy kurt got me into snapchat when i'm hunting and take videos all kinds of shit and send it to all the people i think might be interested in it so adam and all his brothers always get videos of deer and then I, adam's usually whining that he can't shoot the deer so he doesn't want to see him or something like that <laughs> pretty much pretty much how would they find you on snapchat are you just bragging i think it's just mark slagle i don't really know honestly hold on i'm an old man i don't really understand the technology i think it's just mark slagle yeah, looks like it's just Mark Slagle on Instagram or on uh, Mark underscore Slagle on Snapchat. For for all you young kids, get on, <laughs> get on the old snappy chatty with uh, I do. with Mark. If you're a Patreon, uh, I do get on the Marco Polo every once in a while. It's so hard to keep up with all the videos on there, though. You guys are way more talkative than I am, <laughs> so <laughs> I try. I try. All right. Well, I appreciate it, Mark, and I'm glad that we were able to do this. Uh, brought to you by Smoke Wagon and Journeyman Distillery uh, Bourbon. Pick you up some, right? <laughs> All right, guys. Later. Later.